So I want to start tonight with this painting that was uh, painted in 1897 by Van Gogh, uh, by Gauguin, um, by Gauguin. And the, the French up in the upper left corner, uh, I won't attempt to pronounce, but I'll, I'll give you the rough translation, which is, uh, where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? And this is speaking to this, these questions that we all as an individual sort of have to, if we're, if we're thoughtful people, face at some point. What, what is this all about? Uh, what is our origin? What does it mean to be a human in this place? Uh, and what does the future hold? But interestingly, I think uh, we're in a new place in human history where we can ask these questions, not just individually uh, of ourselves and, and maybe even of our society, but about our planet and further about the whole universe. What is this whole thing that we are part of? Where did it come from? Uh, what is it? What are we in it? And where is the whole thing going? And we actually have the tools to talk about those questions now. And I'm gonna talk about them. And I'm also gonna bring in a, a sort of new perspective, I hope, which is not just that we have an amazing universe full of stuff that's doing things, um, but that we have an amazing universe that is full of structures that is built out of form and information. And that there's a story that goes along with the story of a bunch of stuff of particles that physicists love to talk about, uh, that is a story about information and order and its growth um, and computation and uh, agency and mind and so many other things that aren't just the physical universe and sometimes cosmologists tend to neglect. So where do we come from? Where did the matter and the order that we observe in the universe arise from? If you've been to a cosmology talk before, you've, you've probably seen a diagram like this. It's, it's inventorying the stuff that makes up the universe. There's vacuum energy, this mysterious substance that, that pervades space and causes the universe to accelerate in its expansion. There's this mysterious dark matter. Um, and then there's the stuff that we know and love, quarks and leptons and photons. Um, those are the most fundamental particles we know of that make up ordinary matter. And there are uh, other things like gravitational waves floating that, that have been detected recently. And so there's this inventory of kind of the stuff that's out there based on these very fundamental rules of physics. But there are a couple of interesting things about this diagram. One interesting thing is that it leaves off the biggest contribution to energy that there is in the universe. I'd have not you know, to wonder a little bit about what that is. What, what is more than all these things? These are like what you see in the talks, but there's another one It's, why did that happen? Uh, there it is, there it is. <laughs> it's gravitational potential energy. Um, so along with all of the matter that is making up the universe, this positive energy stuff, there's a negative energy stuff, gravitational potential energy. And uh, astonishingly, there's a, a sort of story, a, a creation story in cosmology that says in the beginning, there was nothing. That is, the mass of the universe was zero. And then after that, the mass of the universe stayed zero, still zero today. So how does that? Well, it split itself into positive mass, positive energy stuff, vacuum energy, dark matter, quarks, leptons, photons, gravitational waves, and negative energy stuff the gravitational potential energy uh, interacting with and, and sort of holding all of that together. And so this is amazing story about how all of this stuff came out of nothing, no matter, zero mass. And then all of this stuff created the, the structures of atoms and nuclei and uh, planets and stars and all of those things. Um, but what this is saying is that uh, even these most primordial things had a, a sort of history. They came out of something because even these most primordial things, the vacuum energy, the dark matter, the quarks can turn into each other at high enough energy. So you can imagine a process where none of these things existed and, they, and it sort of split, the, the nothingness split into positive and negative nothingness, and then it's split into vacuum energy and dark matter and quarks and all those things. Um, so all of these things, even the most fundamental constituents of the universe are really structures. They're, they're not like 
just primordial stuff. They're structures that are generated through processes. So when you start to think of the universe is made of quarks and leptons and protons, that's kind of true. Um, but don't get the idea that those are like more real or like the fundamental thing that the universe is made of. Those two are just things that came out of somewhere else that, are, that were uh, created through processes, just like everything else. Everything else in the, in the universe is like that too. It's structures generated through processes. And there are lots of these things in the universe. And in fact, it's made of them. Um, so this is one of my favorite pictures of an atom. So that, that's one atom. It's amazing that we can do this now. A single atom dropped in these uh, optical tweezers and fluorescing so you can actually see it shine. It's you know very small, so, so it wouldn't, you wouldn't see it in, in this picture uh, otherwise. But we can now see individual atoms. Um, and atoms can gather into more complicated things. They can gather into uh, complicated molecules. They can gather into large uh, sort of large scale clouds. That's a, that's a cloud of dark matter uh, that are made of dark matter particles. So these individual particles, atoms and atoms and dark matter and, and those fundamental constituents can gather into sort of one level higher in complexity. Uh, the thing on the right is of course a star. A, just a big ball of atoms that happens to be hot enough and big enough to create nuclear fusion. So there are these uh, beautiful and complicated looking structures, but relatively simple ones compared with uh, what the universe has to hold in terms of life. Life, uh, it's, it's sort of difficult to appreciate the vast gulf in complexity between the, the sort of inanimate objects that we're used to and the the incredible structures that life brings. This is one of my favorite pictures um, showing, this is a, that's a mitochondrium. Um, and you actually see sort of what all the little biochemical things are doing. Every cell uh, like those red blood cells or every cell on that horse is just packed full of these things. Uh, all these little tiny machines acting uh, at tremendous speed, tremendous efficiency and tremendous complexity all the time. So, so it's an amazing thing that we have those structures. Of course, they're collected in bigger ones. We have uh, nice livable structures like this one. We have far away ones. This is one of my favorite pictures of the Earth. It's that little dot uh, just on the left of Saturn's rings. What an amazing view. Uh, collected into even bigger structures, galaxies, groups of galaxies. That's a Hubble deep field showing thousands of galaxies uh, as distance as sort of half or more the age of the universe. And there's the universe as a whole. So this is a, a picture of the universe. We, we took it from the inside, of course, not the outside, because you can't really get out to take a picture of the observable universe. But this is a photo of the observable universe. Uh, we took it from the center and kind of uh, mapped it onto this ball so we could see it like this. When This is when the universe was a few thousand degrees Kelvin. And, um, and the light from that time has been shifted toward the red, stretched out in wavelength by the expansion of the universe. So it comes to us in the microwave, but this is what the universe looks like. And it's an amazing thing that we now can see uh, the like whole thing that we are a part of, the entire observable universe at once. And it's a structure, all of these things are. So, so the universe is filled not just with stuff, but with uh, order that is, uh, what separates the earth from the sun or separates a horse from a rock is not so much the, the fact that they're, you know, what they're made of. They're both, all of those things are made of atoms and all of those things are made of quarks. That's super boring. Uh, what separates them is how those things are arranged. What is the historical process that led to the particular uh, structure what is, and, and order that is built into those uh, different things? But I, I'm saying these words, information, order, structure, what, what are those? Do we have, uh, is that just kind of loosely speaking or are there you know, actual ways to describe these within physical theories? And there are. And these touch upon a, a deep concept that I think gets short shrift. We talk a lot about energy um, and we say energy is conserved and energy doesn't come from nothing and there's an energy crisis. Um, there isn't an energy crisis, as it turns out. There's a uh, entropy crisis, as I'll mention a little bit later. Um, 
entropy is really that tells us something that tells us how structured the physical systems are. If you imagine a bunch of atoms or a bunch of objects, say a kitchen, um, there are lots of different ways it could be. The plates could be scattered all around. The chairs could be this way or that way. The refrigerator could be open or closed. Many different states the kitchen could be in. Um, relatively few of those you say are clean. Relative, a large number of them you say are messy. And that genericness of messy states of the kitchen is what we mean when we say that the a messy kitchen is high entropy and a orderly kitchen is low entropy. So, so entropy is, is sort of just a measure of how uh, generic a property is. Messiness is a property, orderliness is a property. How generic messiness is has to do with how many more ways the system has to be messy than orderly. And then we can flip that around and say order is a sort of lack of messiness. We can imagine how messy the kitchen could possibly be. Um, you've probably encountered that during this pandemic. Um, and when it's not that messy, there's order to it. So you can mathematically think about the difference between the sort of maximum messiness that the kitchen was technically speaking in equilibrium versus the messiness that it has at any given time. And, and the less messy it is, the more order it has. It's fairly straightforward, but it can be made also mathematically precise. Now, so that, that's all fine, except that there's an there's important thing about kitchens, which is, as you know, they tend to get dirty. Just like every other room in your house, they tend to get dirty. They don't clean themselves. Um, and if you don't care, if you're not careful, they get really messy. The order goes away. That's because of this very basic rule, the second law of thermodynamics that says entropy increases in a closed system. And that says order is not created. And we're used to this. It, we, we know that there's a tendency for things to get more disordered. We see it all the time. But if you think about what that means, it's a bit mysterious. Order is not created, but the universe is full of order, right? So where did it come from? This is a surprisingly deep question. When you think about the order that you know about, each bit of order that you pick out, you realize is actually sort of inherited from a larger system. So for example, uh, if you have children and you, you won't let them play Minecraft or Roblox all day, uh, they probably have Legos. And if you have Legos, the Legos look like this picture on the left, right? Their entropy increases in Legos incredibly quickly. Now, those Legos on the left are never gonna sort themselves into orderly little bins by color or anything like that. Uh, but if you expand the Lego system to include a parent uh, that is sufficiently ambitious, then the Lego parent system can turn into the Lego energetic parent system can turn into a sorted Lego system and a tired parent. So by making the system bigger, um, you can bring some of the order, the, the parent's energy that they have into the system and transfer it into a sorted, like an order of the Legos. And the parent loses a little order themselves. They get tired, they have to eat something and so on. So we can always explain uh, order, where it came from, or we sort of have to explain it by linking to some larger system that it's in. Same thing happens with the refrigerator. Um, you can cool down the air in, a, in, in uh, a refrigerator. That means it has lower entropy, but you can't cool your house down with the refrigerator because all a refrigerator can really do is uh, lower the entropy in the refrigerator at the expense of increasing the entropy outside. And so it's sort of taking order from outside tech, you know, it's really taking it in the form of electricity um, and using it to create order in the refrigerator that is cooler, lower entropy stuff in the refrigerator. Um, but at the expense of heating up some air that, that uh, comes out of the refrigerator um, and using up some electricity. So it's inherited again. And this is true of everything. Um, if you ask like, where did the orderliness of the kitchen come from? If you find an orderly kitchen, well, somebody cleaned it probably. Like it didn't just get that way by itself, but how can that person be cleaning things? Like how can that person not reach a state of maximal disorder? Well, they eat food. Food has a bunch of like low entropy nutrients hidden in it. But why is that food not maximally disordered? Why isn't all rice just like rotted away and moldy? 
because we grow new rice, right? We, we take this low entropy sunlight and low entropy soil and nutrients and we create rice. But where did that sunlight come from? Well, it came from this big ball of light source, the sun. Um, and that thing happens to be formable because the, the universe has, uh, is chemically simple. It starts with hydrogen and helium and not big heavy elements that you couldn't form a star out of. Uh, and because the universe starts uniform, that it can form a ball of, of gas like the sun. So there's this uniformity of the universe and chemical simplicity that is a store of order. And so if you ask where, where the order of the sun came from, it came from the galaxy it formed in and ultimately from the structure of the universe itself. So this is a mind boggling thing. The fact that the kitchen is, can ever be clean is due from, to this inheritance of order that came from the very beginning and structure of the universe. Now you can ask, where did that come from? Where did the order in the universe come from? And the answer is, well, nobody knows. Nobody knows. I think this is, this is one of the biggest, if not the biggest question in cosmology. You don't hear it very much. You hear, what is the dark matter? What is the dark energy? Uh, what happened before the Big Bang? Things like that. Uh, those are great, interesting questions, but we can at least sort of imagine maybe not so much the Big Bang one, but we can sort of imagine what the answers are gonna be, even though we don't know quite what they are. I feel like almost nobody has even an idea of what the answer to this question is. Where did all the order in the universe come from? Still, here it is. Um, and we can ask, what what is it become? So the universe has been around for 13.8 billion years. All, this, uh, all these things have happened. The stars, the galaxies, the the uh, planets have formed. And a way to think about that, I think, is through the lens of information. So I've talked a lot about order, but order kind of is information. If you think about what it means to have information about something, say, say a string of bits, it's a one, zero, zero, one, zero. It's a very particular string compared to all the different possibilities for that string. So, so there's sort of a, small class of things relative to a large class, that's just like low entropy. And in fact, you can uh, relate specifically order um, in, the, in the sense that I defined it mathematically to information, Shannon information specifically. So order kind of is information. Um, and the evolution of order, you can also think of in a sense of as information processing, that when the universe is evolving, um, it is, this order is kind of changing forms from one type into another. Uh, this is very much like the sort of information processing that we do you know, in our minds and computers, but not using, well, using very specific rules of the laws of physics, not using the sort of uh, specific rules like computation like we would in a computer, but it's information processing. When, we, when the universe starts out with this chemically pristine gas uh, and there's formation of nuclei and there's star and galaxy formation and stellar evolution that makes us these nice enriched gas spheres um, that, that light up the world. That is a sort of information or order processing. Um, but, but that type is, it, it's super important, but it happens kind of at, at this, this is one base sort of physical level. There, uh, the laws of physics are just kind of grinding out and these, these amazing structures can come out of it. Um, but the sort of complexity, the, the depth of the information processing uh, is not as high as, as things that we've brought into being. We can think of information processing uh, in the context of what we now call computation. So that's something that, that the computational systems that we build do. It's, it's maybe something that the brain does, depending on exactly how you think about uh, neuroscience and, and the way that our minds work. Um, we might even think of computation in the sense of information processing as things that refrigerators or those little active enzymes in our bodies do. So if order is information um, and evolution of ordered systems is information processing and computation is very much about information processing, then this tells us that in, in a real way, a lot of what the, the universe is doing as it's evolving is computing things. And I think we don't wanna take that uh, way of thinking too far. I think we don't want to say that, you know, 
everything is a computation because whenever you say everything is a something, then it kind of loses its meaning. Um, but in some sense, I think there's there's a lot to the lens of looking at the universe as an information system uh, and its physical evolution as something that is a computation. One of those things is that there are physical rules governing computation. There are mathematical uh, sort of structures. There are results showing what sorts of computations can be done and done efficiently, what sorts can't. And there are connections between computation and physics. In particular, if you, there's a, a famous result by Landauer that if you erase a bit of information, you have to create one un, unit of energy dissipation, one little bit of entropy, essentially. So there are close links between uh, what is sort of what can possibly be computed and what can physically be allowed, like the, the sort of resources that you need to do a particular computation. And these rules, uh, although you wouldn't call them quite laws of physics, are in some sense just as important. These laws of computation are just as crucial as laws of thermodynamics or even laws of energy or momentum conservation and so on. Um, so once you start to think about the, the world and the universe as this kind of information processing thing, um, you realize that there are some structures in it that are just astonishingly uh, effective and, and uh, deep in the way that they process this information in a way that the rest of the physical world is categorically different. These are things that we call life, this self-sustaining process that consumes information and holds on to its structure by doing so. Um, things that have agency, that they, they are systems that instead of saying, instead of the best explanation for something happening being, well, the laws of physics made that thing happen, uh, that the best explanation is that something wanted it. There are goals and there are drives rather than states and laws. And this is very much what we think about living things, uh, even though, you know, goals and drives are sort of banned from the fundamental laws of physics, it's clear that things that happen in the, there are lots of things that happen in the universe, like, why did this cup move up? It moved up because I chose to move it up. I wanted it to move up, and so my hand moved it and so on. That's a good explanation for why the cup moved up. A terrible explanation is in terms of quantum mechanics and you know the, the Schrodinger equation governing the atoms in this cup. That is an explanation that you could try to work out, but it will be totally useless and totally beside the point. Um, and finally, intelligence. Uh, there are in biological systems and, and especially, in, but not only in humans, the ability to turn information into understanding and to accomplish goals. And uh, these, these ways of um, like viewing the physical world in terms of you know, we're all we're used to them. Life we're used to. We're used to having agency. We're used to things with intelligence. Um, but we've often separated those out from the sort of fundamental laws of physics. We've said, you know, those are other things. But there are deep, deep, uh, interesting connections between these processes. Like, what is life? How can we think about it in terms of information? How does that information have to do with entropy? How does entropy have to do with physics? And and what is available? And where that that where that information fundamentally comes from? Deep questions that uh, I think we're now that are now starting to gain more attention. Um, and this is. You know, one of the hobbies that was mentioned at the beginning, uh, sorry, that's a little pejorative because it's a, um, it's a uh, lot of work <laughs> that's gone into this institute. But one of the one of the goals of this institute is to kind of connect these uh, these new the these sort of beautiful things about the computational and and conscious and uh, information processing side of the world with those of fundamental physics. So I'd invite you to, to look at the Foundational Questions Institute website. It's got lots of fun stuff. If you uh, are interested in any of the things in this talk, you'll find lots there. Um, and to me, what, what this way of looking at things, especially in terms of information and order, leads to is a, is a questioning of the idea that there's, um, you know, I'm a very card carrying physicist. I've been one for a long time. Um, I like to think about the fundamental laws of physics and say, you know, the fundamental laws of physics allow that to happen and not that. Um, and that's all true. But I think the with time, I've gotten more appreciative of the idea that 
fundamental is a very slippery idea. Um, that there's this idea that physicists have that something is fundamental, it's more real or more true or more right. Um, and I've started to doubt that quite a lot. I, I think it's better to think about reality as having just these different levels, different languages of description. Um, and they're all equally real, they're all equally good, they're all equally important. Um, they're very different in their character. Describing something as, you know, at the level of its intelligence and agency is very different from the kind of fundamental physics level where once you determine the state of the system, you evolve it and it becomes another state and that's unique and all this sort of basic physics stuff. It's a very different description. Um, but I think one is not more real than the other. They are different ways of looking at the same reality. And this is what I've tried very hard to get across in this book that, I, that was mentioned earlier and I will plug here, Cosmological Collins. Uh, it's, it's fun, it's, a, it's both about physics and it's about um, a lot of questions about sort of reality and, uh, and about ourselves. It takes place in a fictional journey that takes place in the early 17th century, starting in Italy and ending up in Japan. Um, it's weird and uh, you might like it. So, so I didn't really answer the question of what we are, and, and I think that's right, but I think there are, there's a perspective about what we are in terms of connection with physics that we are in some sense made of information just as much as we're made of stuff. Um, and that information is, is constantly evolving, it is constantly being processed, it is constantly computing, if we wanna use that word. And we can, we can think in terms of the sort of order and information dynamics of the universe as a whole, and the, the very special way that that is, um, that, that it is applied to the sort of living world that we're a part of, uh, that is unlike everything else in the universe around us. Now, that thing, that process, that started, you know, four billion years ago, where this chemical process, where something just started being able to maintain its its form and uh, and reproduce and vary and evolve, that process has created all of this like amazing stuff around us that we see that is categorically different from the rest of the sort of dead looking universe, and we can ask where where is that going? What is that? What is, where is this life? going? What long-term futures are available to us? And there are some things that we know pretty well. So, so this is the sun. Here's 10 years of the sun rotating around and around, 10 years of it packed into one minute. Um, it's pretty amazing to think of this happening 500 million times this, this 10 years, just does this 500 million times. That's what the sun has been doing since its beginning. Um, it's, it's oddly moving, I think, that the, that the sun just burns and burns in this amazingly steady way, allowing uh, all the, the life to use its low entropy fuel to exist on earth. And the sun will go on for another four or five billion years. It'll get uncomfortably hot in about a billion, uh, but it's gonna be very stable for a while. And, and in fact, physics and, and uh, planetary science and, and other things can tell us pretty precisely how our physical environment is going to, to be for the next uh, long time. So we have say 10 to 100 million years before the next natural mass extinction event is going to happen. So before there's a big asteroid or, or volcano, super volcano or something, a billion years, um, until the the earth gets too hot and and the you know becomes uninhabitable unless we move it or something like that there are schemes to do that by the way um again billions of years of stability in our own of our solar system um and then we've got lots and lots of time until the uh other galaxies sort of disappear due to the dark energy that stars continue to exist so our star is a fairly long-lived star um, but also fairly short-lived compared to a lot of other ones. So, so stars will exist for trillions of years. The galaxy will exist for, for uh, a vast sum of time and protons uh, will exist for a sort of unfathomable amount of time. 
Um, so, so there's a lot of time left for us to physically be in the universe. We've only been around as humans for you know, 100,000 years or so. We've only been around as a technological civilization for a few hundred, um, and we really do have trillions. But um, so those are predictions we can, we can be fairly confident about, about the physical universe. But um, that's only part of the story. And, and uh, to, to illustrate that, I, it, I, I wanted to share this intriguing question. So, so at the beginning, it was mentioned this platform metaculus. So this is something that I've, I've been involved with to kind of create questions that are, that are interesting questions to make predictions about gather the predictions from people um, and <clears throat> collect them together and, and see what people predict about real world events. So here's a question. Will there be a total solar eclipse in 2522? So I, I want you to guess you know, what your prediction for this would be like, yes, no, probably. I'll give you a hint. <clears throat> here's the table from NASA of eclipses in 2500 to 2600. And there's one in 2522 down there at the bottom. 903, nice big one. So <clears throat> you might say, well, this is boring. We know how to do eclipses. We know how to do astronomy. The answer is clearly yes. So what did Metaculus predict for this one? 88%, 88%, like is the system broken? Are people just not what they're doing? No, the system's not broken. And, and these are people who are very good at making predictions, but the people on Metaculus figured that there was a decent chance, like a 12% chance or so, that in 500 years, things could be very, very different. Different enough that the, in, the solar system might in fact be engineered in some way that could invalidate the assumptions of the eclipse prediction that NASA produced. Maybe the moon is moved a little bit, maybe it's not there, maybe it's been turned into a big chunk of a Dyson sphere, who knows? The point is 500 years is an incredibly long time. We've only been around for a few hundred with technology and, and sort of a hundred with, with industry, what can happen in 500 years? We have no idea. <clears throat> and a sort of related matter is this question, the probability of human machine intelligence parity by 2040. This is a bit of a sobering question. Um, and the, and the, the intelligence parity that this describes is a pretty strong form, it's about um, basically a machine system that can answer general questions about pretty much anything better than human grad students. Um, so if you're a grad student in the audience, you've got a 50% chance of being outmoded by 2040 because that's what the prediction is, 50% by 2040. And that's <clears throat> both really exciting, I would say, and, um, and so, you know, a little bit scary. Um, we've seen this amazing transition in artificial intelligence from Go, the game of Go being this thing that the AI would never solve to something that was uh, suddenly the, the, the best AIs were competitive with the very best humans to just not that much longer, systems were learning how to play Go by themselves in 30 hours better than the best human. Okay, so it's a tremendous progress from that will, you know, that's decades away. This is a problem that requires the unique powers of human intelligence to a computer learn to do it in 30 hours. <clears throat> and some problems in AI that, that were thought to be very difficult are turning out sort of to be not problems at all. Um, so so you've, you've probably seen things where uh, computer systems can generate images. Um, so you can, you can like just create uh, you know, pictures of dogs and pictures of cats and you've seen deep fakes, pictures, pictures of humans that look kind of realistic. Um, and you've seen AIs that can generate text or, un or understand text at some level, but people were worried like, how, how are we gonna make a system that both understands text and makes pictures? Like that seems, how, how do we make that happen? And this team uh, behind this doll E system at OpenAI, did it by basically, you know, and, and it's harder than this, uh, but essentially training the system on both a bunch of images and a bunch of text. Um, and it was able to do something like this, which is you tell it, I want an illustration of a baby penguin and a cape playing a grand piano. 
and it produces these things for you instantly. You can try this online, it's really fun. You could have said an illustration of a like mature elephant in a tutu playing the harmonica and it would generate you that. Okay, so this is, uh, they just, they just, you know, spew right out. Um, it's an astonishing level, both of just uh, sheer productive capacity, but also the, the fact that this thing that we thought would be hard, merging different modalities of text and imagery just happens sort of by itself. And so we're, we're going from the, the stage of AI where um, AI systems are kind of surprisingly and frustratingly narrow to where they're becoming surprisingly general. Um, and this is just happening in a matter of years. Meanwhile, the computational power continues to be pretty exponentially increasing with time. Um, Moore's law and, and, the, and uh, Kumi's law that, that talk about efficiency of computation are, you know, they're not quite what they used to be, but they're still going on pretty strong. So computers are getting faster. The level of computational power available for a given amount of energy or money uh, is going up and up every year. So we're now at this place where we have to start thinking about what happens if machines get to be as uh, general purpose and capable as human minds are um, in our lifetimes. And this is a tremendously exciting prospect, I think. The, the having you know, scalable, copyable, engineerable intelligence um, could be remarkable. If, it, you know, if you think about intelligence as the ability to, to accomplish goals, as many people do, you know, almost by definition, you want more of it. You, you want to accomplish your goals better and more and more easily. And so more intelligence <clears throat> in many ways will be so much better. At the same time, I think there are, there are lots of concerns about what it means if we're no longer the most capable, uh, in some ways, uh, intelligences on the planet. If we start delegating more and more decisions to systems that are not us, um, and if we start building systems that have, <clears throat> that are sort of more complicated in some sense than any system that we can actually understand, that are, that are like harder to understand than our own minds, which we can barely understand. Um, and we know that human minds have all kinds of uh, ways that they can go astray, right? There are all kinds of pathologies that people have. Every, rare, it's a rare person whose mind works properly, perfectly all the time. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> sort of never goes off the rails. And people have been battle tested through evolution for you know, millions and billions of years of the development of our mental architecture, you know, only <clears throat> human for 100,000 or so, but the basic way that our minds work as animals has been building and, and sort of uh, like, like tested into deep robustness um, for a huge span of time putting together computers in a span of years <clears throat> and expecting them to be as robust as a human mind, I think is, uh, is, is hard to imagine that it's going to happen. So I think there will be, uh, at the same time as we have machines that are more and more capable, we'll have machines that are more and more vulnerable to going off the rails. And, and the ways that this could happen and the concerns that this raises, uh, if you haven't uh, stayed up late at night worrying about them yet, you can do so after you read these books. Um, so these are ones I would suggest in order of least alarming to most terrifying from left to right. Um, and, and I think this is really something that we all should be thinking about. This, the, the, you know, everybody's thinking about AI at some level, but um, as, this, as this technology that is, you know, displacing people that is uh, like coming into our lives is making more decisions, but we haven't really thought about it you know, as much uh, in terms of what it means for us as a species. Like, what does it mean to think about creating some new intelligence on the planet? Um, but AI is not the only major technology coming online that's going to really change things. This is the, the cost of uh, sequencing a human genome as a function of time. It went from uh, a hundred, you know, billion dollars essentially, or hundreds of millions of dollars when it was first done around 2000, uh, partly at UC Santa Cruz where I am, uh, down to the thousand dollar level and, and much less if you just want to get a, sort of a, a partial sequence. So this is a tremendous improvement that for a long time was way better than Moore's Law. It's 
it's flattened out a little bit, but uh, we're now entering the time when we can sequence genomes very easily and very quickly and very cheaply. And then flipping it around, <clears throat> if we wanna know how um, a given genome turns into a biological creature, if we wanna think about how we could tinker with the genome to get the effect we want, we need to understand that problem of how to map from the genotype to the phenotype. And amazingly, we've had progress there too. So the protein folding problem has been around for 50 years. The idea of you make a sequence of proteins, what, sorry, a sequence of amino acids into a protein, what shape does it fold into? It's been, it's resisted solution for 50 years. It's now solved by uh, a machine learning system from the same folks that brought us that Go playing system. This one's called AlphaFold. Um, you can see that it's, you know, in the 90s, and this was a couple of years ago. Um, so I think we're now at the point where uh, machine learning combined with biology is going to create something almost entirely new. The, the ability to have machine learning systems that can actually work with these incredibly complicated systems, systems that a human can't really hold in their mind at once and sort of manipulate um, because they're just too complex machine learning systems may be able to do that. And so we may, in that combination, really start to gain the ability to imagine, I would like uh, a biological system that, that is like this. What is the genetic sequence that is, what is the genetic program and data that is going to give me an organism like that and start to build them? And that's going to be also something that will change the world. Um, <clears throat> now, if we think about this, uh, the, the DNA that the world has now, um, it's quite a, a remarkable thing. There are five times 10 to the 37 or so bits of information in DNA today. 37 is a really big exponent. <laughs> uh, as, as, a, as a physicist, I start to, to uh, break out into a cold sweat when I see exponents that are more than 10 or 20, like when you get into the 30s and 40s, those are gigantic numbers. Um, and the amount of computation, if you think about it that way, that was done by the biosphere in creating this, the, the, the biological structures that we see is 10 to the 50 floating point operations. So that, that's just unbelievably larger than all of the computations that are done by actual computing systems in the world. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of information processing and computation that has essentially gone into life as we know it. And we're now coming into the, the place where we're going to be able to not just you know, use computations, uh, flops are, are floating point operations. Um, so we, we're, we're not just going to be able to do our own computations, we're going to be able to make use of this gigantic store of computations that have been done for us uh, mm -hmm. by evolution. Now, <clears throat> we talked earlier about the, the sort of uh, wide open spaces in, in time and space that the universe will afford our descendants. Um, we can also think about what are sort of the limits on that. What are the ultimate limits um, that there are to the universe? And it turns out they're, they're very lax. Um, and if you think about how much power is delivered by the sun, like how, how much low entropy radiation comes to the sun, it's this gigantic number, 10 to the 14 terawatts. It's kind of uh, hard to, to conceive of. If we could liberate energy from matter directly, so if we could just turn matter directly into energy, as Einstein's E equals MC squared formula tells us, there is that, that equality, there would be 25 gigawatt hours per gram. Um, so that tells us that you could run, you know, MOS landing power station on one gram of matter uh, for a day if you could convert it directly. So it's, it, it's a lot of power. Um, so there's both huge amounts of power coming to the earth and huge amounts of power just latent in all the matter around us if we could just liberate it. Meanwhile, a human brain just takes about hundred Watts um, of low entropy energy to run. So, you know, used at maximum capacity, there's a lot of brains that could be run, a lot of people, a lot of experiences that could be had uh, using these uh, processes. And, and energy resources that we have. The computation limit uh, that I mentioned earlier, the land hour limit is 10 to the 19 flops per watt. Um, that, is, uh, that is a very great 
Uh, uh, I think about how much that is, that sort of um, the, the largest computing systems in the world are running at sort of 10 to the, I think, 16 or 17 flops. Um, and so, so this is, you can get tremendously more efficient than the computers that we have now. And if you multiply those together, 10 to the 19 flops per watt and like 10 to the 25 gigawatt hours per gram, you can get a lot of flops out of a gram of stuff. So there's a tremendous resource for doing computations in the universe. We're not gonna run out of that any, anytime soon. Um, and there's a lot of stuff out there. There are a hundred or so billion galaxies in the observable universe, each with hundreds of billions of stars. Granted, they are very, very far away. The speed of light is a frustratingly slow thing compared to the size of the universe. Um, but also, it's not that slow. Going across the galaxy would take sort of 100,000 years. And again, we have billions and billions to do it. So once we escape from the Earth and start to, uh, if we make it that far and, and start to travel at anything like the speed of light, it will be long compared to human, human uh, lifetime. But compared to the time that uh, life has in the universe, uh, it will be very short. And, and life should be able to spread out uh, very far throughout the universe if it already hasn't. So there can be a lot ahead for humanity. We have a lot of questions, I think. We're, we're sort of at a turning point um, where we, the, the fundamental sort of nature of life on Earth is, is at play. Um, and we have to do some thinking. We, you know, what do we really value? Why do we value it? Um, how do we compare or quantify that value if we're thinking about choosing one thing or another, one path or another for uh, life. Is there any value in an unconscious universe? Uh, one thing that, that is a little bit odd to think about is, you know, if we, if we were to replace ourselves with uh, or be replaced <laughs> once we create them with machines, uh, will those machines be conscious or not? I think we don't know. And um, if we fill the universe with unconscious but intelligent things, have we done something? Uh, is that a, a tremendous loss? Um, a question I like to think about is what, what could we do now that our descendants would, would thank us for, or, or what would we do that now, what will we regret? Um, I think, for example, you know, thinking about this immense amount of computation that the, that the world has done to create the genetic information and the life on earth now, the fact that we're, we're taking that term, the, the, results of that gigantic computation and just kind of dragging it into the trash can um, by, by killing off huge numbers of species on earth. This is like the biggest mass extinction in, in hundreds of millions of years, um, or probably a hundred million. We're gonna regret that. Like with all this incredibly hard fought information and structure, we're just letting it go, you know, so that we can uh, make a few more farms or, or you know, get things a little bit more cheaply in the rainforest and so on, we will clearly regret that. And I think we should think um, just like we do as individuals, am I doing something I'm really gonna regret later? Um, we should think about our future self just, and, and we should think about our future society when we make our choices. And how can we best use our resources to improve the world? Um, unfortunately, I think there's a big question as to, uh, not just what the future is gonna be like, but if there's gonna be a future, um, we've come disturbingly close to, if you wanna be really disturbed, you can go to this webpage of the Future of Life Institute about accidental nuclear war. Dozens of times that we've almost had uh, nuclear accidents or exchanges. We've been extraordinarily lucky, but relying on luck is not a good long-term strategy. <laughs> you can only get lucky for so long. Um, and, even worse, along with nuclear, we're introducing more technologies that can be harmful or, or devastating to humanity, um, including you know, AI weaponry, including engineered uh, biological creatures or, or engineered pandemics that could make COVID-19 look like a total walk in the park. Um, we have a lot of thinking to do about how we can harness the, the sort of positive side of these really powerful technologies um, 
while actually taking seriously the idea that they could they could do a thing. We take risks strangely with our uh, sort of world as a whole that you'd almost wouldn't take for yourself as an individual. Um, and and yet the stakes are so much higher. So um, I think this is this is a, an issue that we need to be putting more attention to. The, the fundamental character of life on Earth is rapidly changing. These emergent technologies promise power, but uh, incredible new risks. There are lots of organizations, some of which uh, I'm involved in, the Future of Life Institute, for example, um, but lots of other ones as well. The UC Earth Futures Institute, Metaculus, uh, the Center for Existential Risk, the Future of Humanity Institute, which I think are, are somewhat categorically new, thinking about the, the world in this larger context of uh, large time scales, large distance scales, um, thinking about the fact that, you know, as a species, we could do ourselves in and how can we prevent that from happening? Uh, so I think there's hope, but I think there's a lot of danger and, and lots more needs to be done. But if we can survive, if we can make it through this period, I think there is truly an, a sort of astonishingly rich future awaiting us. Uh, we will, uh, just like the technology that we enjoy now would be unimaginable to people two or 300 years ago, our quality of life is unimaginable to people two or 300 years ago, the, the typical you know, person in Silicon Valley. Um, that probably will be true in the future. Um, and, and so I think we, we sort of wanna take that long view and think about like what we can do to bring into being that sort of a future. And, and I like to, to think about this quote from my favorite philosopher, Bergson, uh, which is that people do not sufficiently realize that their future is in their own hands. Theirs is the task of determining, first of all, whether they want to go on living or not. That's the risk. But theirs is the responsibility for deciding if they want merely to live or to intend to make just the extra effort required for fulfilling, even on their refractory planet, the essential function of the universe, which is a machine for the making of gods. So I think we, there are exciting times, exciting things ahead of us as a species, uh, but also dangers. And um, I think we all have to, along with our daily life and asking us ourselves, where do we come from? What is this? Where are we going? Let's ask that of the world um, and see if we can make something useful out of the answer. So the, that's it. Uh, and I, I look forward to chatting and, and hearing some of your questions. All right. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I think it's time for some questions now. Uh, it looks like we already have some flowing in, but audience members, feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions. I'm sure you guys have plenty for him, but I'll just kind of start here right at the top. Um, <laughs> first question is, uh, what's flops? Yeah, so I, I, I actually saw that one come up. Uh, flops are just floating point operations. Um, so floating point operations are floating point operations per second. They both are, are written as flops, even though they're two different things. But um, yeah, so usually a, a sort of measure of amounts of computation that you've done. Awesome, great. Um, Another question here, it says, is there such a thing as practical AI versus conceptual, in parentheses, lab controlled and constrained AI? How can AI be trained to be practical and valuable in the real world? Yeah, so certainly there, um, there's, a, there's a big gulf between um, what it takes to function well in the real world versus uh, the much more simplified system that a lot of machine learning uh, or the more, more simplified environment that a lot of machine learning models function in. So, so Go, you know, or or games like that are much easier for machine learning systems because there's you know a, a very well defined system. There are very specific rules, and it can just play the game over and over again and learn how to do it. Um, that's something that I think we shouldn't minimize the importance of. You know, if you had said to someone 50, you know, 30 years ago, here's a system that if you give it any game and let it play itself, it will learn how to master and beat any human at, they would say, wow, you have artificial intelligence. And then you say, well, sort of, but not really. Uh, just play, it just learns games. Um, so I think 
there's a big gap between what it takes to play a game well and what it takes to function in the real world, which is a much more complicated uh, and open system where the rules are kind of constantly changing and there are lots of other agents happening. But um, we also have come a long way and NAI researchers are now making their sort of make-believe worlds much, much more complex. So if you look at what DeepMind is doing now, it has, you know, they will be training agents in a sort of still a model, still simplified, but a sort of real world where they're moving around in their tables and they can pick them up and you can uh, and manipulate things and put them down. And, and so I think there, uh, there certainly is a prospect with time for AI systems to become more and more capable in the real world. We're seeing that with self-driving cars, of course, um, where first it seemed really hard, like how are we ever gonna make a self-driving car? Then suddenly people thought like, this is really easy. And then they realized again that it was really hard, uh, but we're sort of converging on self-driving car systems that are sort of working and getting steadily better. And it, who knows how long it's gonna be before they're really good enough to, for people to, to entrust themselves with, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's happening. Awesome. Um, thank you. There's another question here. It says, what are your thoughts about uh, different dimensions in the universe? I will interpret that to mean like different, maybe different numbers of dimensions. Sure. Uh, so, so we as everyday beings inhabit three spatial dimensions and one time dimension. Yeah. Uh, but that is certainly not baked into, it, it's very hard to see, to have three plus one emerge from any law of physics. It, it seems to be just a sort of contingent um, fact about the universe that there are three spatial and one time dimension. And most physical theories operate perfectly well in some other number of dimensions. You know, you can you can think about gravity or electromagnetism or whatever in four or five or six dimensions with no problem. If you go much lower, things start to get a little bit weird to one or two or three dimensions. Uh, things are too simple for, for certain types of physics to be interesting. Um, but you can then ask, like, are is it possible to have regions of the universe with different numbers of dimensions? Could there be other dimensions we don't see um, off some direction. Um, and almost everything you can think of by randomly speculating like late at night with a drink uh, is, in a, is in a physics paper somewhere. So, so people have definitely worked out a lot of these ideas. At the moment, um, the, some of the most interesting contexts are uh, string theory where we have a beautiful theory that seems to unify gravity and quantum mechanics, which is sort of a holy grail of physics, but requires 11 or 10 dimensions. And so this has made people who, who really like string theory much more open-minded about the number of dimensions that we have. Um, and then there, there are other theories of extra dimensions that people have been even testing, like in the, in the Large Hadron Collider. These theories mm -hmm. are, are kind of made up just to, to be interesting. There's no reason to have these extra dimensions like there is in string theory. But it's something we can look for. I mean, you can. It it is possible that we could get a headline, you know, a year from now, you know, fifth dimension discovered, and that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, but it fits into solid physical theories that we can test. Yeah, that's always been a it's an interesting question. I feel like that we've been trying to think about and figure out for a long time. Um, got a, another question here. It says, how do we know whether our system, uh, the universe we live in, is closed or open? How do you know? How do we know that low entropy ordered systems, galactic and biologic, biologic, have seized the tendency towards complexity and are now trending to higher entropy? Can AI be considered intelligent without biologic, uh, biologic, sorry, uh, desire and emotion? Okay, so I can take those in turn. Um, mm -hmm. So the the universe is, um, in some sense. The universe as a whole is in some sense the only closed system that really there can be in the in that um by definition the universe has no outside if you think of it that way um so in that sense it's a it's a it's a closed system uh at the same time any sub part of the universe is in principle an open system and that's all, all we ever really have access is to part of the universe so so it's a complicated question i would say um the, in terms of you know if this is in terms of entropy increases only in a closed system, um, I think that that is an important, a very important point in the sense that as I pointed out, um, 
as soon as you embed some system in a larger system, it, it totally changes the rules, right? It, something can go out of equilibrium. Something's in equilibrium and it's a closed system. It can never leave equilibrium. It's stuck there forever. If it contacts an outer, you know, a bigger system, then it can go out of equilibrium by interacting with that bigger thing. Um, so the question at some level is, I mean, maybe part of the question is, is there something bigger than the universe that could help it go out of equilibrium and explain this, this uh, what I call the great inheritance of information at the beginning of the universe? Maybe, you know, maybe there's a multiverse. Um, you'd still have to worry about the entropy of the multiverse. Um, so, so it's a very tricky thing. It's a little bit like, um, well, God made it. Well, who made God? Well, I don't know. Uh, it was always there. So um, that's a tricky one. It's, it's both closed and open in certain ways. Um, how do we know that entropy, low entropy ordered systems have ceased the tendency toward complexity and are trending toward higher entropy? entropy? So I would say complexity and entropy are not, there's a tricky connection between them. So higher entropy, I would say there's a technical sense in which it means lower order, um, but you can have a low entropy system that's very simple looking um, and a high entropy system that looks very complex and vice versa. So it's, um, they're, they're distinct sort of concepts. Entropy is pretty well defined. Complexity is, there are more different definitions of complexity I think people have and there isn't a really agreed upon one. Um, so like the, the beginning of the universe was very low entropy, but very simple, didn't look very complex. Uh, so both things are going on. There is a tendency of some physical systems to get more complex and other ones to get more simple. I would say uh, that is also true. So life tends to get more complex, for example, um, while you know, just stuff uh, often tends to get more simple as it goes up in entropy, uh, but both can go on. And then can AI be considered intelligent without biological? uh desire and emotion i think it depends on what you mean by intelligent and and i think we um if intelligent means able to say form goals and figure out what has to be done to accomplish those goals i think it probably can be i think we it's demonstrably true that that si there are machine systems that can be given goals and figure out how to accomplish them and accomplish them whether those whether there will there will be a point where they can't get past because they don't have something that humans have like a body or embodiment in the real world or something biological. I think we don't know. Um, so, so I think we don't know what capabilities machine systems will eventually get to uh, without some of the things that we have. But I think intelligence as a whole, like in, at least in some dimensions, can get quite high without, without having those things, I would say. Great. Um, got a question here, just not really related to you, but I'll just answer it for you. It says, can we get a copy of the trans transcript somewhere on the webpage? We will be posting a replay on our YouTube page and YouTube does generate uh, live transcripts that you can, you can see so that uh, you will be able to access those after this is over. Um, another question here for you, it says, is it conceivable that we would learn to understand wormholes slash traveling through a rip in time space? I think you're on mute, Anthony. Thank you. Um, maybe. So, <laughs> so wormholes and are sort of tantalizing in the sense that you know we really want to be able to get through uh, the universe a lot quicker than the speed of light. Mm -hmm. um, and wormhole solutions do exist in general Einstein's general theory of relativity. So you can yeah. write down things that look like wormholes where you know, there's a shortcut from one point in space to another. Mm -hmm. um, what tends to happen, you find, is that in order for the wormhole to exist, there has to be some sort of substance that is Einstein's theory of relativity connects the structure of space-time to the, the matter and the properties of matter that's in it. The matter that you need to have those wormholes turns out to be pathologically weird, like negative energy, um, which is seems to be very bad from all, in all kinds of ways. We don't know anything that has negative energy, really, at least not in large amounts, um, and it seems to have all kinds of problems. Um, so it's probably the case that 
to make a wormhole, you need a bunch of negative energy and that just can't be done. That being said, there, there has been some interesting recent work that claims that there are wormhole solutions that don't require negative energy. I haven't made up my mind about whether I believe this or not. That mm -hmm. would be really, really exciting and interesting and strange. Um, <laughs> But I, so I think we don't know. I would bet like, I would say like 95% plus that we need negative energy and that we can't get it and we're going to be stuck. Uh, but I think there's still like a 5% chance that, that things will turn out with some loophole that we might be able to do it. Very interesting. Yeah, it's all <laughs> kind of one of those sci-fi things that uh, we were always thinking about in the back of our heads. Um, I got another question here. It says, "Is if entropy is always increasing and order is inherited, how is it possible that black holes in our universe could be the birthplace of new universes?" Mm. Yeah, so it may not be. Uh, so, so there's an idea that that black holes uh, that you could create baby universes inside black holes, and this is something I've even I've even spent some time thinking about. Um, and I think. It's, it's tricky to know how the accounting works. So there's a, a theory that I didn't mention, but is really important in the kind of standard model of cosmology now called inflation. The inflation theory says that in the very early universe, the universe expanded exponentially, kind of driven apart by a really high density version of the vacuum energy we see now. Mm -hmm. And the, the important thing about that inflation is that it creates space time. It takes a small space time and blows it up to be really big. So you can imagine that if a, if a black hole were able to create a baby universe that was then inflating, uh, then the black hole would create this little thing and it would create a big universe that seems to have low entropy. Now, there's a worry that it's cheating, that you shouldn't be able to take something that's high entropy and turn it into something that's, made, that's low entropy. That violates the second law uh, and it doesn't seem to happen in a real physical system. And that seems like it would kind of be doing that, but I think nobody quite knows, essentially because we don't know how to really understand the entropy of gravitational systems, which a black hole and a wormhole put together and inflation really are, uh, that we don't really have a handle on whether that is allowed or not. So I would say we just don't know. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Um, Another question for you it says, is there any effort by politicians to work with and be informed by researchers and academics who understand the major issues that you have laid out in this talk? Yeah, I, I think there are some who would like to. I mean, I, I think the life of a policymaker is a, is a very difficult one. Um, there, you know, we, we get angry at our politicians and I think for good reason, but we've also put them in a system that's kind of impossible um, in that they, they constantly have to worry about getting enough money to get reelected to and like have figure out how to make deals to to get like anything done and they can't get anything done. So there, there's a pretty terrible set of structures that we've created for policymakers at the moment. Um, I think and, and one of the side effects of that is that they have really no time to understand almost anything, you know, in the sort of detail that you would want them to. Uh, and I think they would like to. So I, but I think they're, it, it's rare that they are going to, um, you know, that a busy politician is going to tell their staff, I really want to understand this thing, go learn about this thing in great depth, go consult the experts, uh, you know, go find people in academia who have been thinking about these big issues and talk to them. I think they would like to do that. I mean, it sounds great. Um, but the, the system that we've created makes that not happen. So I think it's up to, I think it's both, it's their job, but also ours, um, you know, people in academia or the, in the nonprofit world to try to make those connections. Um, they won't happen by themselves. And I think we should, we, we need to really encourage that. That's part of what we've been doing at the Future of Life Institute is trying to connect, for example, people who are thinking about new laws about artificial intelligence in the US Congress to people who are developing AI systems or thinking about AI systems and researching them. Um, they don't run into each other on the street or at the coffee shop, they have to be brought together. Um, but it's, they're both happy to do that. You know, it, once you do it, you see that it's really important because people are making laws that 
I mean, how are they going to know what the right sort of law is to make um, if they're not talking to the people who understand those things? So, so I I totally agree that that's super important, uh, and I think it it's something that we really have to encourage and incentivize. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question for you. Um, it says, what are your thoughts on UAPs and the US government releasing everything it knows about them on June 1st? <laughs> I'm eagerly looking forward to the June 1st report. Okay. It'll be fun to see. Um, yeah, I, who knows? Um, I think they, there's um the 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 ufo phenomena has gone from like i would say from something where it's easy to dismiss to something where it's really confusing frankly because like it's not swamp gas you know it, it's not like mass insanity so what is it i don't know i would guess it's probably not aliens but what is it it's really hard to come up with right, what the right explanation for all these different pieces of data is. So uh, I, my personal feeling is, um, you know, you have to think about everything with probabilities. And my prior probability that there are aliens flying around in the skies of Earth uh, is very low. Um, so it would take a tremendous amount of evidence to, to bend those up to, to like high numbers. But at the, at the same time, um, it's not clear what the obvious boring explanation for them is. And so mm -hmm. I think there's something interesting there. It will be, I would love to know what the whole thing, you know, what is going on? Will we get some answers? Probably not, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. It's something I feel like we've never been told. It's been talked about for decades now and we've kind of all dismissed it and everyone's called a conspiracy theorist if you believe in them. And it is just something I don't know why we're not told about them. Like it's clear that they are they're there. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm also... what it is, yeah, I really don't know what it is. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I've unfortunately I occasionally get asked like, "You're an astronomer. You're an astrophysicist. You must be privy to this information." Sadly, yeah, uh, I'm not. Yeah. Well, thanks. I appreciate the answer. That's super interesting, um, and we'll look forward to June first. I guess it's coming up here soon. Um, Another question, I guess, kind of along those lines, actually, says, do you imagine that we are in an evolutionary race with other intelligent species in the universe? Given the amount of information generated in the universe, how likely do you think that there is life out there that would face the same challenges of the future of intelligence? Yeah, it's, this is a, there's a lot of, a lot packed into that. I think the, um, the weird thing about other life in the universe is the is still the same question that Fermi asked, which is where is it? And in, in that, you know, I, as I expressed, it only takes a hundred thousand years or so at the speed of light to fill the galaxy. Um, so if you would think that if any species in our galaxy had succeeded in doing that, uh, they'd be all over the place, and it would be totally obvious. Not just the that they'd be unidentified vehicles in the air, but but we would see large scale relics of them. Stars would be engineered, like all, all kinds of evidence would be around, you would think. So it seems like something is wrong with that argument. Either there isn't life in the galaxy or it doesn't spread or it's invisible or, you know, there are all these, ex all these answers to this Fermi paradox, almost none of them particularly satisfactory in my view. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that seems most, most uh, the answer that seems sadly or maybe maybe optimistically, most probable to me is that um, the development of life really involves some incredibly incredibly difficult and rare step. Um, that maybe you just need five thousand atoms to come together in the right way to create a self-replicating piece of RNA, and if you do, it'll only happen once in the observable universe, and and most universes won't have any at all. Uh, in the sense that like the nearest origin of life could be sort of indefinitely far away. So that would be kind of disappointing. Like if we were just literally alone in our whole observable universe, um, super boring in terms of science fiction. At the same time, a great opportunity uh, because there's all this undeveloped real estate that's out there um, and we don't have to you know encounter anyone and fight them for it or be wiped out by them and so on. So which is the better scenario to be in? I'm not entirely sure, honestly. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's another one of those questions I would love to know the answer to. And people are working, you know, that's one that 
that used to be only semi like uh, there's a lot of respectability now to looking for life out there in the universe that used to be just disreputable as well. Now it's totally a normal thing to do. Um, and it's happening on a pretty large scale and we'll see. Yeah, super interesting. I mean, it seems as though we would, the probability and statistics would be that we would find other life at some point, but it is also, like you just said, just absolutely wild. It could be very, very far away indefinitely. Um, another question here, it says, could you elaborate a little more on the concept of positive and negative gravity and its implications for the development of this universe? Yeah, th this is a, an interesting story that I think gets told too little. Um, so if you take two rocks, right, one might be a kilogram, another is a kilogram, you put them on, you carefully weigh them, two kilograms, you take those two rocks and put them next to each other and weigh them, it will be a tiny, tiny bit less than two kilograms because the gravitational uh, force between them corresponds to gravitational potential energy in physics, and that is negative. And because energy is mass, that's a little bit of negative contribution to the mass of the system. So two rocks together are a little bit less massive than, than two rocks separate. Now, you never notice that on a daily level because the difference is like, you know, a hundred billionth or something, a ridiculously tiny number. But if those objects happen to be black holes and you merge them together, you would find that the black hole that you make out of the two black holes is like significantly like, like tens of percent um, less massive than the two black holes individually before you put them together. So once gravity gets strong, this becomes a really important effect that the, the negative contribution of the gravitational potential energy. And um, when you get to also the scale of the universe as a whole, it turns out, so gravity is, is a large scale force. Once you get things that are really big, like the universe as a whole, um, it almost necessarily, this negative gravitational potential contribution becomes big. Um, and so you can, you can argue, and gra energy is a little bit tricky to define in this way in, in general relativity, but there are, there are reasonable arguments that say that the universe as a whole has zero energy. Um, if the universe is what's called spatially closed, like if it's finite, you can actually show formally that it has zero energy, like by definition almost. Um, and so that zero energy, as I said, has to be broken up into the positive energy of the stuff and something negative, which has got to be the gravitational energy. So um, yeah, that's seldom told. It, it's a, but it's, it's just true according to general relativity. And I think it is the way that you can cheat and bring into being all of this stuff without like hugely violating conservation of energy or something like that. Um, conservation of energy doesn't always mean what you think it means. Uh, and this is very much one of those instances. Interesting, very interesting. Um, I know we are coming up, we have about five minutes left. And I do want to be cognizant of everyone's time. So we do have quite a few questions left, but I'm going to uh, just kind of go through these last few ones that we have uh, as much as possible, but we will try to end around 630. Um, so it says, where and how does what we're learning about quantum physics and computing fit? Um, well, yeah, so, so quantum I mean, quantum physics, everything is quantum. And so, so when, you, when you read about like quantum health and quantum healing, it's all true because uh, everything is quantum, just maybe not in quite the way that it's advertised. Um, but we're now getting technologically to the point where we can harness the effects that are particularly quantum. Um, so even though everything's quantum, it, a lot of stuff acts like classical systems, just like it's in a particular place, it has trajectories, et cetera. Um, those quantum aspects are generally hidden from us, but uh, quantum computing and other quantum technologies, quantum cryptography and communication, secure communications are now just starting to be like viable technologies. I think they, my guess is that quantum computing will be a pretty big deal um, in the sense, uh, my personal prediction is that it will end up being a really big deal primarily because it enables us to, to understand, to simulate physical systems in which quantum effects are important really well. So for example, if you're, if you're designing uh, like chemical systems or, or new materials, 
uh, it's very hard to do those on a on a classical computer. Um, you just can't simulate them well. They, the quantum effects are important. If quantum computers can be used to simulate quantum systems so that we can engineer new types of matter, new materials, and so on, that could end up being like it sounds a little bit boring, new materials, but like lots of technologies are possible and lots of things are possible because of new materials. Um, and so I think they could be, it's not maybe that sexy sounding, um, but I think they could end up being really important because of that. They're not general purpose for the most part, so they won't do everything. Um, whether they'll end up being useful for machine learning, things like that, I think is still somewhat unclear. Very interesting, thank you. Um, maybe one last question here. Um, says, I'm curious between the relationship intera and interaction between the microcosm studied in biology and macrocosm studied by cosmology in terms of entropy and complexity of information, how are they related and or different? Yeah, I, I think they're, they're, they're deeply interconnected, certainly in, in some of the senses I described, like um, the, the ability for organisms to maintain their structure, like homeostasis, they they have to continually absorb information from their environment, um, and that information in our world is provided by the sun, and it's only providable by the sun because the sun uh, is in a nice big empty, chemically uniform, simple universe like it is. So there there are these ties, um, in that sense. I think there are also so, that, so that's a sort of physical tie. I think there are also, um, you know, in the long term, I think we're we're just at the beginning of. I mean, basically, there's been like 13.8 billion years where where the universe was thinking, but kind of asleep. You know, it wasn't uh, unless there are other other life out there. It wasn't self aware in the same way that. Uh, that that we enjoy. It was processing information. It was doing interesting things. It was forming structures, um, but it's now doing something very different, and it's doing that through us, through living creatures, uh, through humans, through our technological artifacts, through the the new computational systems that we're devising, through the new sorts of life that we will probably invent as we become able to to engineer new life that may merge with computers who knows what's going to happen and if that starts to happen off earth on a large scale um, essentially the whole observable universe could be filled with that and that could be you know just like the case of the eclipse by the moon mm -hmm. um, you know we could be changing the physical universe on all scales you know all the way out to the largest so i think um we right now are the beginning precursors of the universe change, you know, undergoing a phase change into a, almost a totally different thing because of this process of life. Um, so I think they're, they're also deeply interconnected in that way in the long term, if awesome. we don't kill ourselves off. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a great ending point. I think we will go ahead and wrap up here since it is 630. But um, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight to Virtual Cafe Sci. And thank you, Anthony, again. Uh, for taking the time to speak with us tonight all about the universe, modern cosmology, aliens, UFOs. It was super awesome to listen to. Um, for me, it was super interesting to learn about. I was super excited for your talk. And I know based on all the questions we had, our attendees definitely found it fascinating as well. Um, audience members, our next Cafe Sci will be coming up in June. So be on the lookout for the registration link in our uh, follow-up email. And with that, uh, have a great rest of your Thursday evening, and I look forward to seeing you all next month.